Got it? Okay. Okay. So yeah, symbiosis. What is it? It is in general a relationship between two species that share the same environment in nature. Um, generally that's uh, characterized by some sort of interaction that occurs between the two of them. Um, the classic example that you see here, we have the sea anemone and the clownfish. It's a great example because clownfish lives inside the sea anemone. Normally the sea anemone stings kind of like a jellyfish, uh, but the clownfish has evolved to not receive that sting. Um, so it has a safe place to hide, and in return, it fends off things like butterfly fish that would be trying to eat the sea anemone. Classic example. Um, very important, it's not learned behavior. One clownfish didn't decide to go and, oh, this might be a good idea. It's this behavior that evolved, it's instinctual. It is a part of their biology. Now, often when we think of symbiosis, the kind that we think about is the kind like the clownfish and sea anemone. It's the kind um, that we'll get into what it's called in a second. Um, but we can see here, most of the reason why we think of that is because of the root of the word symbiosis. Sim, like sympathetic, means together. Biosis, biology, living, life, living together. So we think of symbiosis, it literally means living together, right? So we think of it being, like the clownfish and sea anemone, cooperation. Um, but they're not all like that. This is called mutualism, so they both get something out of it. You can see here, they're both happy. <laughs> Cyclical relationship going on there. Um, but who can tell me what the opposite kind is? Anyone know? I'm sure we have a lot of educators here. Yeah, right back there. Could it be parasitism? Yes, parasitism. So that's the opposite, where one gets something out of it, and the other one is sad, because it's getting something taken away from it. So that's parasitism. Um, can anyone that's not an educator tell me what the third kind is? I'll give you a hint. Give you a hint. Now these are biological evolved relationships, so something's gonna get something out of it, right? So we're not gonna have negative for both, and we're not gonna have neutral for both, right? So what's the one left out here? If one's getting something out of it. That's <laughs> <laughs> it. Uh, so am I saying the word? Or the... You can name the concept, concept if you want. <laughs> well. Whatever you want. <laughs> commensalism, that's right. So commensalism where one is getting something out of it and the other one doesn't really care. They're not hurt, they're not helped. They're kind of neutral. They're kind of blah, they're fine. So those are the three kinds. Now there are two that I didn't really bring up. Um, there's some debate as to whether or not they're considered symbiosis. Personally, I think they are because they're relationships between two species that share an environment in nature. Um, and that's predation and competition. Um, in the course of researching this, I found some people were arguing that they're not because it's not a long-term relationship. The bear and the salmon don't have this. But as we can see, there's a lot of evolution that drives the way that predation works. Um, and the same with competition. It's more indirect, but we can see that, you know, in nature, uh, in the course of competition, these animals end up evolving their niches. So. Um, anyway. um, but I'm not going to talk about those today because each one could be a whole presentation on its own. So we're going to do a quick little run through. Um, I'm going to throw up a picture, shout it out if you can guess what kind it is. Um, and I'll just go over briefly uh, a little bit of information about how that works. First one. Mutual. <laughs> that's right. We all know that one, but I just went over it, so that's pretty easy. What about this one? Parasitism. Parasitism, yeah. So, that, so that's a tongue eating louse. What they do is they go into the gills and they get up on a tongue. They don't eat the tongue, so it's a bit of a misnomer. But what they do is they clamp their claws on the base of the tongue and they cut off blood circulation. So the tongue falls out. Uh, and then they act as the tongue for the fish. So they kind of move food around. Um, and they get out of it is um, they actually will feed on the blood and secretions of the, of the fish. So, yeah, not, not a good relationship with the fish. But, you know, it doesn't die, so that's good. Um, Parasitism. <laughs> this one, and I'll give you a hint. <laughs> we'll be out there. That's the best bird poop right there. <laughs> good thought. Mutualism. Yeah. So the bird gets food, and the plant gets to spread its seeds. And that's called endozookery. So that's 
um, a seed dispersal technique that plants have developed. They create a tasty little nugget, so that something will eat it. Not always a bird, sometimes it's a squirrel or something. Um, and then they'll spread it out, they'll poop it out, and the seed will be able to grow in a new environment. And you have a theme going for these two slides, we have this one. What we got here? Seed dispersal. That's also seed dispersal, absolutely. All right, so that's conventionalism. Um, that's called epizootry. Um, so that's when, so the burrs, yeah, it's kind of annoying, but it doesn't really hurt the dog. You know, in general, it'll just hang on their fur until eventually it falls off. Um, so plants get something out of it, gets to spread its seeds. Other animals aren't going to bother. Hermit crab. Anybody? No? Commensalism. Commensalism, that's right. So they take the, uh, the shells. Um, that's something he's not using. You know, they're not using the shells anymore. So they can take it with them. I'm good to go. This one's obvious. There is a So that is called Griffin's isopod. And what they do is they go up under the gills of the mud shrimp and they, you know, drink his blood. Maggots. <laughs> Commensalism. That's right. I was expecting somebody to, to guess Ferritism, but no, they didn't have the commensal because uh, the thing that they're eating is already dead. Mutualism. That's right. I'm not even going to go through all of these because it's going to take forever. I put them in oh, why was that mutualism? <laughs> that was mutualism because it's feet. Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> fine. All right, so that's an owl crocodile, and that's an Egyptian plover. And the plover is eating food bits that are stuck in the crocodile's teeth. So it's cleaning out the teeth. Uh, in exchange is getting food, so they both get some out of it. Wow. Nature's food. Nature's food. Mutualism. Mutualism. Pollination, great example of mutualism. Plants get to, you know, spread themselves, and uh, bees get food. Classic. Raccoon eating trash. Commensalism. Commensalism. Yeah. Again, it's one of those ones where, like, well, my, I'm hurt. My trash is in the, is in the lawn. They spread disease, but in general, you know, we're not getting significant here. So it's <clears throat> yeah. What's the word? You want to do the back? They these share something in common, which is the first word in their name. They have what? That is a vampire bat. Yeah. And that is the vampire brown finch, which is a parasitic finch that lives on the Galapagos Islands. So it actually will peck into other birds. That's another bird right there. And they will drink the blood. Bravo Island turns up some pretty strange stuff. Why does the other bird let it do that to That's actually a very good question. I'd imagine kind of like this. Um, it probably hits it when they're sleeping. Um, just cuts tiny little, little cuts and then drinks the blood. Uh, I know for vampire bats, a lot of times it would be like cattle and stuff with those. Make little tiny scratch they barely notice. Um, so I imagine it's the same, um, but I'm not sure. I haven't looked it up. There's this one. That is a tomato hornworm horn caterpillar, mm. and that is a uh, larvae, well, they're cocoons from the larvae of a parasitoid wasp. So, parasitoid is that got some um, is when the parasite kills the host. Normally, parasites don't want to kill the host because then they lose their source of whatever, food, home. Um, but parasitoids, they get something out of it. Uh, in this case, they lay their eggs, the wasp lays the eggs in the caterpillar. Larvae hatch, eat it up, make little uh, uh, cocoons, and then they grow into full one. What about this guy? Can anyone tell me what that's called? It's an oak fall ball. Yep. But as an oak, they're called oak apples, they're also called gauze. So what that is, is there's a type of wasp, which I can show you in a second. This might my spoil a little bit. Um, it's a type of wasp called a gall wasp. There's a huge, there's a bunch of families, so it's not just one species. It'll lay its egg in the bud of an oak or other plants. It's not limited to oaks. Um, and when the larva hatches, it'll emit secretions that cause the tree to grow around it. Um, so you find these a lot of time on the ground. Um, they're like, they're, sometimes they're green if they're new, but if they're on the ground a lot, they get kind of uh, brownish, golden. Um, and they have a little hole in them. 
and that's because the larvae hatched, it, it ate inside of it, lived in it as a home, and then it ate its way out. Um, but the trees are harm through the process, so it's going Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> um, so there's some thought that uh, you could argue that the initial relationship between humans and canines was commensal, kind of like the raccoon, um, like it was living off our waist. Um, then obviously we didn't like that, and we decided to have friends. So this one, um, that's a great hornell. And that is not a great horned owl nest because great horned owls don't make their own nests. That is a red tailed hawk nest. Um, so, this is commensalism because the hawks don't use them at that time of year. A lot of owls, especially great horned owls, they breed in the off season, they breed in the winter. So, they kind of use it, they squat there while the hawk's not home. All right, this guy, we are taking a lot of time on this section. <laughs> So I'm going to power through them. This is parasitism. It's another parasitoid. This is the Ophiocordyceps unilateralis. Um, it's a fungus that infects the ant. You might have heard it. They call it the zombie ant fungus. So it actually takes control of the ant's body. will make it climb up to the top of the tree, um, where that will grow out of it. And it'll spread its spores and infect the whole the whole. Body. And now we got three that are linked, and we'll get to it in a minute. This is another example of mutualism. Same as the Nile crocodile and the Egyptian plover. So that is a red billed ox pecker, and it is eating pests out of the ear of an impala. Um, again, it gets food, impala gets to not have pests in its ear. And this is tricky. It's, I'm, I'm, what I'm going for here is not mutualism. Can anyone tell me what it is? Anybody? Did you know why? Mm. Well, that, that really care. Yeah, that, that's a good good thought. So they are getting food. So this is not the best picture for it, and it's kind of hard to find a picture for it. Mm -hmm. um, so bison and other migratory ungulates, when they're walking, they stir up a lot of stuff. Um, so they stir up a lot of insects. And so birds like these starlings will follow herds of bison in order to eat the insects that they start up. And that relates to our final example. Parasitism. And I tricked you all here saying I was talking about symbiosis, and really I was talking about root parasitism. This is parasitism. Um, the reason it relates to the last slide is this is called a cowbird. It is the young form of a brown-headed cowbird. Um, and it is a brood parasite, which I will go into in a minute. Um, but one of the reasons, uh, I'll, I'll talk about it. It's related to the last slide, I promise. Okay, so brood parasitism. What is brood parasitism? It is a strategy, biological evolutionary strategy, that was developed by certain birds, about 1% of all birds. It's also called mass parasitism. To rear their young. Um, so the female parasite will lay its egg in the nest of another bird. Now, as some of you may know, raising young is kind of hard. It takes a lot of energy. So nest parasites don't want to have to do that. Well, want is kind of a mis misdirection, but they don't do that because it's a lot of energy, and so they decide what they're going to do instead is they're going to lay their eggs in other birds' nests. Now we have here facultative versus obligate. Um, that's jargon. Obligate, obligation, something we have to do. So obligate brood parasites are birds that have to do that. That's how they reproduce. That's how they always reproduce. That is their, the way that their life cycle works. Facultative is the opposite of that. It means they don't have to. They do it sometimes. So normally what we're talking about when we talk about facultative versus obligate brood parasites is we're talking about birds that parasitize other types of birds and birds that will sometimes lay their eggs in the nests of other birds that are the same species as that. So basically if a bird's nest is destroyed or something and it's still got eggs it wants to lay, it'll hop on over to a, a fellow female's nest, lay, drop its egg in there, and that way, you know, the species as a whole gets, gets helped. Um, so that is facultative versus obligate. We're going to be talking about obligate today, because that's more interesting to me. <laughs> 
There are only two obligate bird's nest parasites in the United States. The first is the bronze cowbird. You can see the little map up there. Not really much the United States. It's mostly Central America, Southwest US. Um, you might be able to tell. You really can't. There's some in Florida, down there. Florida gets a lot of weird stuff. Um, but the one we have around here is the brown headed cowbird. We have a ton of those around here. I am sure you will see them if you look out for them. Um, they are all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, so what does the parasite get out of this? As I talked about before, it's hard to raise young. Now they don't have to. Um, going back to the bison before, I told you I was going to bring that up again. Um, one of the theories for how it developed in the brown-headed cowbird was that cowbirds would follow the herds of bison that would cross the plains. And they couldn't really afford to stop and build and their own nests and lay their own eggs and care of it because then the bison would be gone. So instead, they would drop their eggs in other birds' nests, and that solves that problem. So why is it parasitic? Why isn't it commensal if the mom's already kind of uh, getting food for her own young? I'm answering the question with some pictures. Now, who can tell me something about these pictures that might answer the question? Big mouth. Big mouth. That's actually really important. Um, so I was expecting more along the lines of it's bigger, which is kind of that, but the big mouth is key, so very good observation. Um, yeah, they're bigger. They're generally bigger. They take up more space. They hog the resources. Um, and I'm going to get back to that in a minute, so good answer. Um, now, cowbirds don't generally eject the other host young, um, but the way that birds feed their young is they go for the ones that are the most healthy and most fit because they're most likely to survive. So the cowbird's bigger, makes more noise, and so they're like, oh, that's my healthiest child, I'm gonna feed that. Um, and so as a result, a lot of the um, host children, host babies, end up starving and dying. Um, and that is also partially because of what we call supernormal stimuli. Great example here is the big mouth. Now, what do we notice about that mouth versus that mouth? But other than being bigger. I think somebody said it. I think Red. It is a lot brighter. So that sticks out. Um, so what a lot of parasitic birds do is they have adaptations um, called, that make use of supernormal stimuli um, to attract more attention. So they're louder. Um, that makes the host bird think, oh, there's a lot of babies in this one spot. Um, some of them actually have uh, evolved like yellow patches under their wings so that when they're begging, it looks like there's other chicks there. And so the mother will go to that chick. And that's not calories. <laughs> okay, but this is a relationship and relationships change. Uh, in the course of evolution, of course, in a parasitic relationship like this, probably advantageous, advantageous for the host to fight that. So we have egg rejection which is where the host mother will notice that an egg is not theirs and knock it out. And this is uh, the discordancy hypothesis versus true recognition. Auto and out versus template matching. <laughs> That's the easier way to refer to that, those two big terms up there. Auto and out is this egg doesn't look like the rest of the eggs. It's not mine. Template matching is this egg doesn't look like what my eggs are supposed to look like, so it's not mine. Scientists think that birds tend to use this one. Um, part of the reason why is that it's not always the case that one egg will be a parasitic egg. There might be more, there might be two, there might be three. So if you're just picking the one that looks different, maybe it's your egg and then you're picking that one. Uh, and then there's chick rejection, which is where the chick will get kicked out of the nest. And that doesn't happen as often. Um, part of the reason why, in fact, the main reason why is that it's a bigger risk. You've already put time and investment into it. If you happen to kill your own chick, that's a much bigger deal than knocking an egg out of the nest. Um, interestingly, if the adult host birds see a cowbird, adult cowbird, or one of the other birds we're going to talk about later, um, around, the rates at which they will do egg rejection and chick rejection go up. Because they're alert, they're aware of something's going on. They have that drive of like, Oh, I, that, I don't trust that brown-headed bird over there. All right, so three birds we're going to talk about. Common cuckoo, the cuckoo finch, and the tawny flanked cranium. Now, I did this uh, on a Mac, and then I had to transfer it over to a PC, which is why some of these aren't formatted. Mm -hmm. I apologize for yeah. that. 
Um, so the cuckoo is a pair. The cuckoo is a parasite. It is Europe, Africa, Asia. Cuckoo fish, Africa. Tawny flame prima, also Africa. Now these are the ones that are in a direct relationship. Cuckoo finch is a parasite for the tiny plant. So, talking about symbiosis and the way that things have a relationship, they live together, we have something called coevolution or an evolutionary arms race. And that is where two species evolve against each other, just like an arms race. One develops this thing, and the other one develops this thing, and they're, they're competing, trying to you know, get a step ahead. All right, so cowards don't really use egg mimicry, but cuckoos do. Egg mimicry is where they evolve to have an egg that it looks similar to the eggs of their host. Now, cowards are generalists, and what that means is that they lay their eggs in really any nest that's around. They don't have a specific host that they go to, and specialists have a specific set of hosts that they go to. Um, so cowards, journalists, cuckoos, and definitely the cuckoo finch are specialists. And I'll go over why the cuckoo finch is really crazy in a second. Okay. So part of that is because we have another two set of words. Rejectors versus acceptors. So rejectors are birds that are more likely to reject an egg that they think is not theirs. Or chick. Um, and acceptors are birds that just don't really have as much of a drive to do that. They still will, but not as much. So, because cuckoos are specialists, and they started running into a lot of rejectors, they evolved egg mimicry, where their eggs look like the eggs of the birds that they're parasitizing. But because they started doing that, the hosts evolved to have eggshells with a lot of different colors and patterns. Um, so females of the same species might have eggs that look very different. So the same species, two females in that species, might have eggs that look completely different from each other. And I'm going to show some pictures of that in a second, so you can look. Mm. Okay. So cuckoo has these things called gens or genjis, which is basically genetic groups. Um, so think of it like um, the last, I'm going to say go ahead. Individual female cuckoos will have specific hosts that they target based on their egg color. So the female cuckoo, based on their genetics, and it's only the females, because the males can mate with pretty much any female they want. Um, the female cuckoos will have, like, hair color. So a female cuckoo will have an egg that they lay that's blue and has little speckles. Another female cuckoo will have an egg that's red and has little speckles. Um, and that means that they will target specific hosts um, when they lay their eggs. And this is an example. So up here are the common cuckoo eggs, and up here are the hosts. So these are all different females. And these are all different species. So individual cuckoo females have eggs that look like the eggs of different hosts. Now who can tell me which species here might be an acceptor, not a rejector? So the dummy, which is a, uh, a brown like sparrow-like size bird that lives in, in Europe, it is an acceptor, not a rejector. It doesn't tend to have that impulse to reject. So the cuckoo didn't bother at all <laughs> to, to make the eggs. So that's just a really good example. Like we have these, uh, these that really match really well, and then there's this one that just like totally does not match at all. <laughs> this is another one. Okay, so these are the cuckoo finch and the tawny flying cr cranium. So all of these on the outside are the same species. These are all from the tawny flying cranium. And then the inside is the cuckoo finch. So the cuckoo finch is trying to match with individual females of the same species. Yes, yeah, so they're basically like the most specialist that you could get. Because they're targeting individual females of those species. Scouters, they don't use that. They have another thing that they do. Uh, cowbirds are, they're, they're cheaters even among the cheaters. So if uh, a bird figures out that a cowbird has invested their nest, cowbirds will just go in and trash the whole thing. They just, they just destroy the whole nest. Like, oh, you're, you're gonna toss out my baby, then I'm just gonna destroy the whole nest? That's what you get. All right, so last two birds. 
All right, so these are the last two that I'm going to talk about. Um, the horse field bronze cuckoo, which is a parasite, and the superb fairy wren, which is a host. These are Australian birds, so things are going to get really wild. <laughs> okay, so superb fairy wrens are an example of birds that use chick rejection. So they'll wait until the chick hatches to reject because they use an acoustical arm trace. So, horse field bronze cuckoo is their biggest parasite. Par parasite. The shiny bronze cuckoo is less frequent. And the reason for that is because the horse field bronze cuckoo will, has evolved to mimic the begging calls of the, the young chicks. So they can actually pretend using sound that they're the chicks of the superb fairy bird. Shiny bronze cuckoo doesn't really do that, so they don't tend to survive parasitizing the superb fairy wren, so they kind of evolved to not buy it. But the superb fairy wrens were going to take that line down. They are like, uh-uh, we're not doing that. So they have something that they, the scientists in this article refer to as embryonic call learning. So they have an incubation call. They will sing to their eggs. And then when the eggs hatch, they will remember the signature elements of that incubation call. So when the nestlings use a begging call, it has that signature element. And that's even crazier because scientists that were doing this paper, they took eggs from one superb fairy wren and they put it in the nest of another superb fairy wren in order to test, is it genetic or are they actually listening? And the foster eggs learned that call too. So it is not just genetic, they're actually learning it, they're listening to it and hearing it, and then they're able to reproduce it. So why don't the cuckoo chicks learn that as well, right? If it's something they're learning in the egg, and the cuckoo egg is in there, why isn't the cuckoo chick learning it? Well, a lot of nest parasites actually hatch earlier, and they do that because it's an advantage for them. They wake up earlier, they can kick the other eggs out, or the other chicks when they, when they hatch. And that actually backfires, because they don't have as much time to listen to that call. It's, it's a matter of days. It's not even that long. It's, we're not talking about weeks or months. It's like five days for the, for the um, superb fairy wren chicks. And then, the, because the cuckoo, yeah, cuckoos hatch earlier, they only get two days. And that extra three days, they don't learn it. So yeah, superb fairy wren can catch them out and then you get a chicken down. Okay, so yeah, so that's co-evolution and symbiosis. So we sort of have a sense of how, um, I hope we have a sense, of how um, symbiosis and co-evolution can, can go in so many different directions. You know, and this, we use brood parasitism as an example, but this sort of thing, the way that two species can evolve together, that occurs all over. You know, the examples we saw before, things just, and organisms just develop this, these strategies and these relationships that they can interact with each other. Now we do have something after this, which eh, it's a little bit after 6.30. I have something else that I'm hoping to do with all of you. Magic So there's a uh, these two over here. Um, but before, first, I'm going to just see if there are any questions. Is there any questions? Okay. No, so it's a big chess game. Basically, yeah. Give and take. Yeah, absolutely. Someone, they make a move, somebody else makes a move, um, and they just kind of... Um, I have a list of sources and um, of the articles that I use if you think it's interesting. Take a picture of the, the screen because, I mean, I just scratch the surface. I mean, there's so many cool group pairs, it doesn't mean super interesting. Is there any bird in particular that the brown and cowboy They just. They really, I mean, they're generous. They really just hit up a ton of different birds. Um, I will say, I didn't mention this. Um, a lot of brood parasites that are generalists, sometimes they'll accidentally lay their eggs in a nest of a bird that doesn't feed their babies um, insects. Because um, generally speaking, paras uh, bird parasites are insectivorous. Insectivorous. I've never seen that word right. Um, so they need that extra, those extra calories. Um, so seeds don't really do it for them. So if they accidentally lay their egg in the wrong nest, then that chick will starve. So it's not going to get them. Anybody?